The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and communion of the Holy Spirit be with you. It is a wonderful morning to be in worship, so let's start off with prayer. God, we come before you today in your house as your people called by your name. You are our giver of life, our creator, our redeemer, and sustainer. God, may the words of our mouth and the meditations of our heart be pleasing to you. Lord, in this space, may your spirit move among us and through us so that as we go forth, you may work your will through us, your church. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's find your mother, son. Come here. Let's sing.
Good morning, church. Good to see you all here and uh, all you folks on the internet watching us, uh, welcome to. I'm here to read the scriptures for you tonight, uh, today, this morning. We're going to be reading Matthew's uh, chapter 6, verses 1 through 15. Please pay attention to the word of God. Be careful not to do your acts of righteousness before men, not to be seen by them, If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets, to be honored by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. This is the word of God. Praise be to God. Now, that's better. Good morning. Can you say good morning? I am sure. Good morning again, Eli. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, Stella, you you can't have those. No, 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 you can't. If we have some extras... I'll give you an extra one, okay? Okay. She really likes to help. Well, you're going to get to help me again today because we talked about the Lord's Prayer in Sunday school. So, Eli, can you tell me when it says, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, what does that mean? Do you remember? We're supposed to praise God, and hallowing means to honor him, to praise him. Okay? 
your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What do we do to, to help God on earth? Can you think of something? You, you've told me a couple of things in Sunday school. What can we do to honor God? Can, yes, yes, you can believe. That's the number one thing to do. And you can do what your parents ask you to do, right? You can do your homework. We talked a little bit about homework. Yeah. And give us this day our daily bread. What does that mean? Is a loaf of Mrs. Baird's bread going to fall from heaven for you? <laughs> no, I don't think so. But God's going to make sure that you have the food that you need to remain healthy. And to forgive us our debts. What are our debts? Any idea? That maybe make God not happy with us? So we have to ask for forgiveness. And if a friend of yours calls you a bad name, oh, but then you really like your friend, so you're going to what? Yes, you're going to forgive them. That's right. All right. Let's close our eyes and say a little prayer. And then I have a little something for you. Dear Lord, thank you for these beautiful children. Please keep them safe from temptation and guide them along the path that you would have them to go. In Jesus' precious name.
Our scripture today is all about prayer, and I feel a little convicted about my pastoral prayer, you know, when the part it talked about babbling in many words and thinking they'll be heard for their length. So I'll try to keep it short, but we have a lot to pray about, don't we? We come just as we are with the joys and the thanksgiving, but also with the anxiety, the cares, and the stress. So come as you are. We will pray to God silently as a whole, and I will pray on our behalf. With that said, let's go to God in prayer. Our Lord and Father, you are in heaven and with us, and indeed holy is your name. Lord, we gather just as we are, bringing the things of this life to your house with your children, lifting up our hearts, our worship, our praise, our cares, our thanksgiving to you. For all that we are, all that we have is yours, as we are yours. O Lord, we strive to be your kingdom people, and our Lord today teaches us that in all things we ask and seek to seek your kingdom first and for your will to be done. God, we confess that we don't always live up to that mandate to be kingdom people pursuing your will above all else. O oh God, for the ways in which our own agendas and our own fears and our own stuff leads us astray. O oh God, forgive us. Restore us to the path that you have for us. Make us followers of our Lord. Make us effective for you, we pray. God, of all the things that we thank you for, every breath, every blessing, our daily bread itself, Lord, we thank you for your grace, for your mercy, for you being a God of second and third and infinite chances, most of all. Oh God, our Lord reminds us today that we are to bring our needs before you. That that is at the very core of what we lack. Daily bread, O oh Lord, for those we know and those we love, takes many forms. God, we know many right now who daily bread, what they need, is surrounding a situation of physical health and the lack thereof. God, for those whom daily bread is healing, we ask for it. And in the midst of uncertain diagnoses, in the midst of recovering from surgery, in the midst of lengthy hospital stays. Oh God, may your peace in their hearts, may your spirit coursing through them be the daily bread that sustains them while they wait. And that ultimately makes them okay. God, we lift up those for whom daily bread is a need for reconciliation. A need for a lifted spirit and a lifted situation. A need for peace of heart and mind and spirit, for peace in a family. God, may the daily bread of your healing work its way in any way that you will it in these situations. For God, in the midst of messed up lives and a messed up world, God, we confess that we so often cannot see a way forward or a way out or a way for reconciliation, and God, that is what you do. Making a way out of no way, bringing hope when things are hopeless. So God, we ask that you would. And God, we ask that you would inspire us, enliven us, we, your people and your church, to go forward into this world as a beacon of the light of Christ. The one who taught us to pray. 
the one who showed us how to live, the one who died and rose again, and in whose name we pray. Amen. So hopefully some of that last scripture reading sound a little familiar to you. You know, it's funny, whenever you actually go to read it, even if I'm reading it in the NIV or the ESV or the NRSV, I still put, who art in heaven, the KJV is strong. <laughs> yeah, last week <coughs> was probably the hardest part of the Sermon on the Mount to deal with. That turn the other cheek. Don't resist the evil person. Go the extra mile when compelled. And there's that last part, right? Be perfect as God is perfect. Well, I feel like Jesus has done us a solid favor this week because now we're dealing with the most comforting passage that there is. Something that is core to our identity, to who we are, our very soul, the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer is special even though... If we're honest, we kind of say it from rote memory. We probably give it a little less thought than we should and treat it like it's a prayer in and of itself rather than a template for praying. But that doesn't make it any... One of my personal special moments where I feel the Lord every week is when I get to stand behind that table and for one of the rare moments in this service, shut my mouth and hear y'all praying. Knowing the different lives, the different situations, different places on faith journeys, and hearing everyone join together in that one prayer. It's a symbol of unity that next only to the table is moving to my heart. It's also moving personally because there have been times I have prayed that prayer only because I didn't know what else to pray. At the rec site or the hospital bed, when I was too afraid, too anxious, didn't know how to put my feelings into words, there's that old prayer. And if Jesus said it, I can't go wrong with it. And so I prayed it there. Also think back to the Lord's Prayer being a central part of youth ministry for me. Because one thing I would do at every confirmation retreat with the Presbyterian Church, that's basically a fancy word for baptism class, and I would do it every year with every youth group I had, we would rewrite the Lord's Prayer in our own words. And we would usually sit down and write out on big, giant post-it notes, and we would put it up on the youth room wall with our yearly covenant we all signed to each other. And it would be there to guide us in living into community and learning to follow Christ. And there's some really fun conversations around the Lord's Prayer because when you start getting the actual words of it broken down by teenagers, it can be interesting. Sometimes a little trying, like how would you say our Father who art in heaven and I heard everything from just dear God to yo homie Jesus. <laughs> and you know, we, we in the church, it's fun when you go to a different church because there's always that tense moment of is this a debts church, a trespasses or a sins church? Especially when you have a wedding or a funeral and the Lord's Prayer is in it, it's always like leave a pause because you're going to have a lot of different stuff. Well, we may wonder about the words, but them, to hear them gloss over the uncomfortable idea of sin sometimes. God, help us to do better where we mess up. And then that leading to deeper conversation. No, what are we really saying? What are we really praying? Who is God to us? What is our daily bread? What do we ask for? And what is this stuff about forgive as we're forgiven? Yeah, the Lord's Prayer has provided the scaffolding, the groundwork, the opportunities to have those faith-building conversations. And I remember one enterprising young lad turned this passage, the surrounding material of the Lord's Prayer, right around on me. Because also I would struggle to have kids volunteer to pray at the close of youth. I'd say, Who'd wanna, who wants to close us out? Crickets. The funniest was a snarky kid one time if you know teenagers, they'll respond to anything with, your mama. I said, who wants to pray? And this kid under their breath said, your mama. So I pulled out my phone. I called Diane DeSteiger. I said, I had a kid who responded to, who wants to pray with your mama? And my mom, without missing a beat, closed us in prayer over speakerphone. <laughs> mama DeSteiger for the win. But no, I would use this passage to teach that, you know, anybody can pray. 
It doesn't have to be complicated. You hear me or Pastor Mark or Pastor Jim or Pastor Danny or whoever talk for a really long time, but it doesn't have to be like that. Simple to the point. So if you want to pray over the offering in church, go for it. If you want to pray to close youth group, go for it. Pray at camp. Please, come on. Like, let's get some, let's get some involvement here. And I had this one young man who hated talking in front of people. He loathed it. It was like pulling teeth, and he said, Josh, I didn't say right there to go into your room and close the door and don't let anybody else hear you pray. I'm just going to keep doing that. <laughs> Touche. Touche. Yeah, the Lord's Prayer is the key of who we are and what we do. It's a template. We know it's how Jesus taught the disciples to pray. And we could spend forever going line by line, and we'll, we'll do a little bit of that to see what it means and look at it through fresh eyes of kind of how it affects our faith journey and who we are. But we're going to do something a little bit different because usually when we talk about the Lord's Prayer, we just take the prayer itself. Because that's enough. That is plenty, but I feel like it is where it is for a reason. Right before it is what you heard when Jesus says, be careful when you do charitable acts, when you do good. Don't do it for laud or approval but don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. He's telling his disciples, don't like blow trumpets and say, look at me, I'm doing nice things. Be a ninja out to sneak up on people and bless them. And then there's this. And then the next passage after it is, and when you fast, when you're going through a time where you're abstaining from eating or you're fasting, don't look somber. Comb your hair, wash your face, wear some ever-loving deodorant. That's basically in the language what he said. Be a contributing, normal, smiling member of society. Don't draw attention to it. And what's amazing is in the lectionary, kind of the preaching schedule for the year, you get the first and the last of that passage, but you don't get the prayer itself. One through six, the whole, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, don't give in public or you've already received your reward, is then paired with that, and when you fast, don't be somber and smelly. But the prayer is left out, and the prayer is taken as a whole by itself. But I think sometimes we do that at our peril, so that's why I included that don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing in with the Lord's Prayer, and I cut out the fasting part just because I don't want to deal with it because I like to eat and I've never missed a meal. But that's neither here nor there. But I think it is all part of the bigger narrative of the Sermon on the Mount in terms of Jesus is calling you to be transformed from the inside out in such a radical way, to be builders of God's kingdom in such a way that it affects your prayer, your service, your religious practice, and in doing so it just might affect people around you. So when we get into this, let's have fresh eyes to see how the Lord's Prayer and the admonition to give in secret, how they might work together in this people transforming, kingdom building work that Jesus is trying to do here. So that first part, the don't give in public, we can all pretty well identify with, right? Because let's face it, we live in a world with social media and news where politicians, to try to get some credence, they're always pointing to the charities they do. They're shaking hands and kissing babies. Big corporations sometimes like to point to their charitable foundations, of course not to do it humbly, but to say, look at us, we're involved and we care. People, especially in youth ministry, we're the world's worst to take pictures of ourselves and post them online on mission trips to say, look, I'm a nice person, I'm a good Christian. And we know that's not supposed to be the way. And some of us, Maybe we do acts of kindness or acts of charity simply because we don't want to be seen not doing them. I don't want to be seen as the one who walks by the person and doesn't do anything. Or maybe, I'm sure for most of y'all sainted people, this isn't the case, but it's, it's the case for me. Maybe you have a guilty conscience and you feel like if I do something good for someone, maybe it'll somehow on a cosmic level right the scales just a touch. Like I said, none of y'all would ever feel that way. I just have a guilty conscience. And so, of course, Jesus saying to do it for those external rewards. That's not what you're called to do. You're called to do it just in obedience to God, to meet the need, and it will change something. God will reward you, but he doesn't say 
Then he goes in to the Lord's Prayer. Remember, this is a time when public displays of religion were very important in their society because there is no separation of church and state. To be a good citizen was to be religiously devout. And so he tells them, don't pray in public big and loud and gaudy. Don't give your arms, alms in public big and loud and gaudy. Do it in private. It would have been a little bit flying in the face of establishing a good reputation. Even though in today's culture, you would be looked at a little bit strange if you prayed really loudly in the marketplace. Who doesn't know? Go pray in quiet. And it'll change something. You'll get a reward from God who sees what is said in private. And then he gets into the meat of the Lord's Prayer. And when you pray, pray like this. Our Father in heaven. Right there, the very first word hits me. While the Greek translation doesn't make a big deal out of it, for me it's meaningful because our Father, we in our individualistic society, self-centered society, I'm all about my Jesus, my Savior, my walk with the Lord. Our Father reminds me I am a beloved child of God, but I am not an only child. The Christ-following life is done in community as one of God's children, knowing that everything else I ask for, God's not just seeing the situation from my perspective. God's not just seeing the daily bread I need. God is seeing millions of needs, millions of the hurting, millions of the faithful. It's meaningful. And sometimes it's good to be reminded of that because if you have that only child syndrome, you might find yourself a little entitled or spoiled, so I've been told, though... I think it's mostly nonsensical because I'm an only child and only grandchild and I'm certainly not spoiled at all. It's a good gig if you can get it. Our Father in Heaven. That Father is a loaded phrase in our modern context. right? A lot of people have eschewed that Father language for God because they didn't have a good relationship with their dad. Human dad stuff is complicated and it's hard and so sometimes seeing God as that Father figure is... Difficult, but look at what it would have meant to the people in his time. You're in a society that, yes, your father was close, but the father was the undoubted sovereign head of house. He is the one who made you. He is the one who named you. It is to the father you belong. I don't think he said father on accident. Our father. We are God's beloved children. We are in community with each other. And our God is both intimate, near as our next breath, near as a loving parent holding us, but is also so sovereign that we are belonging totally to him. He is the one who gives us our name, our place, and our belonging. Then the hallowed be thy name, or hallowed is your name in the NRSV. He goes back to the third commandment. Remember God's name and keep it holy. Right after the introduction, God who is our Father, who is sovereign yet intimate, help us to keep your command. To remember that even your name is sacred and holy. Recognizes who God is in relation to us and then lays it out of let me keep your law. Your kingdom come, your will be done. That's crux of Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is pointing to he is building a kingdom, he is building a family that is not of this world. He's basically saying the filter through which everything else is going to pass. When I ask for my bread and I ask for forgiveness and I ask for what I need, filter it first and foremost, God, through what you will, what you want, and what builds your kingdom, even if that means telling me no. That's a different way of praying. That's a radical way of praying then and now. Through my prayer, work to make this world, my life, my situation, more like your kingdom. Then he gets to the ask me, the give me part. Give, me this day, give us this day our daily bread. And I wonder why Jesus is so condensed on the give me part. Part of me thinks it's because he knew that people don't need to be taught how to ask for stuff. We get that. But still, notice what he's asking. Give me my daily bread. The base minimum I need to get through. I don't know about y'all, but I tend to ask for stuff above and beyond that because I'm an ambitious sort. 
My daily bread, well, no, that's like the food in my belly and keeping the lights on, that's between me and my employer. That's between me and what I put in the bank. That's between me and my family. Like, that's daily bread. God, I am dependent on you for my next breath, my next meal. Everything I have truly comes from you. But then also, he is asking for what is needed at the core. Because if I'm asking for food, I'm not asking for a loaf of Miss Baird's. I'm asking for bacon wrap filet or like Axis back straps because that stuff is good. Um, give me what I need. And then he gets into the part on forgiveness. And this is the fun part because like I said, there's the three types of churches, sins, trespasses, and debtors, and you all may be waiting with bated breath to hear which one is right. It doesn't matter. But I will tell you, in, in the Greek, it is debts. So we're doing pretty good. It's funny, taking a poll of the churches I've attended and worked at, Central Christian Church in Weatherford, where I grew up, debts. Good. Irving North Christian Church, Irving, Texas, debts. Faith Presbyterian Church in Alito, Texas, debts. First Christian Church, Wichita Falls, Texas, sins. So I've been saying the same thing for like 26 years. My second week there on the job, they have me leading in the Lord's Prayer. And what do I say? Debts. Everybody else says sins. And I turn red and look like an idiot. Thanks, boss. Now, in, in the original language, it is debts. It's saying, forgive me all that I owe you. Anything that is due you, God, I know I am not capable of actually giving. And then the hard part, as I forgive those who might owe me something. I want to be, forgive me my debts and I will go and try to forgive others. But Jesus doesn't let us get by with that. Forgive me what I owe you, O oh God, to the same way in which I forgive the people who owe me stuff. Once again, that's pointing to a radical transformation and radical building of God's kingdom. And then he says, Lead me not into temptation. Lead us not into the time of trial, but deliver us from evil or the evil one, depending on the translation. Well, it's literally asking God, God, I can't be righteous without you. Dear God, I don't have it. Whatever is required to stand firm in the face of temptation, that thing Jesus did for 40 days in the wilderness, I ain't him. I can't do it. So God, if I'm going to do anything resembling righteousness, anything worthwhile, anything good, I need you. To lead me not from temptation not into temptation, because I can find it myself, thank you very much, and deliver me from evil. And then actually nowhere in there is, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. We just added that somewhere in 16 O Moses because it sounded good. So you take this in a whole, and it's a different way of praying. And then Jesus adds that last line, which is kind of this text equivalent to, oh, and go be perfect as God is perfect. For if you forgive others their trespasses, and that's correct, they do use the Greek word for trespass, misstep, to step on someone else's property, so the Methodists are right too. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your Heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. That's hard. So where do, we, where do we find this? This wonderful way of praying. Our Father to forgive me as I forgive them and daily bread and deliverance from evil. How does that coincide with the admonition to give in secret and not for external reward? And then the weird part about when you fast, don't be smelly and dirty. You can go read that for yourself. Both of them are internally motivated and they are the evidence of a changed and transformed heart. And I say that because you will not only do acts of service in private. Jesus healed people when it was obvious. 
The disciples healed people, did good things, fed people when it was obvious. And you will too. But doing it in secret is proof that God is at work in your life. Because when you give, when you help, when you serve in ways that no one can catch you doing it, when you're willing to be seen as somebody who walks by the person in need because it's so not about your ego and then you slip up on them and bless them unbeknownst, that's proof that God has done something in your heart and in your life and is changing you. Because remember that kind of vague reward? He doesn't say what it is Maybe the reward when I give in secret, when I serve in secret, not for my own ego, but in obedience to God's word and God's will, maybe the reward isn't the changed situation. Maybe the reward isn't anything external. Maybe the reward is the simple fact that through it, God changes me. And guys, every prayer is not going to be a Lord's Prayer prayer. Because the prayer I'm good at is, Dear God, please help. God, give me this, get me through this, get me out of this, protect me from the consequences of my own stupidity. I've prayed that a lot. We're good at that prayer. And Jesus knows we'll do it. Help so-and-so, they need it. The laundry list of please do or even please forgive, this is how I've messed up. God, this is what I need. There will be those prayers. But those prayers don't take a lot of faith. Plenty of people, and maybe some of you even remember a time when you were questioning, praying the prayer, Dear God, if you're real, if you're listening, get me through this one. And that's a wonderful prayer, that first step back home. But that prayer doesn't take a whole lot of faith. The laundry list prayers, when it's Saturday and I don't know what I'm preaching about on Sunday, Dear God, help me. Those prayers when there's too much month at the end of the money or when I hear glass breaking and I've lost sight of my toddler. Those don't take a lot of faith. Those are externally motivated. But to pray, God who's close but yet ultimately sovereign, of whom I am your child but I know I'm not alone in this, I'm called to be your child in community. First and foremost, help me keep your law for your name is holy. And I'm about to ask for stuff and ask for the things I need, but God, first and foremost, if it's not fitting your will or building your kingdom, say no. Because that's what I'm after. And God, give give me what I, I need, but just whatever it is that I need to get through. Whether that's the healing, whether that's the blessing, whether that's the bread, or that's just the peace to suffer through it, God, you know what I need. Give it to me. And God, forgive me anything I owe you because I can't pay up. And you know what, God? As I forgive others, because in contrast to what I owe you, nobody owes me a doggone thing. And by the way, I can't do this righteousness thing on my own. You've got to lead me away from temptation. You've got to give me the strength to stand. That's a prayer that's faithful. And not every prayer will be that. But when you find yourself praying those prayers and meaning it, you might just find that God has rewarded you for your prayer. Because whether the situation changes or not, you have a heart and a life that is from the inside out transformed. So we're going to be a church who serves and who does good works when people are watching, and I hope and pray when nobody sees it when nobody catches us. And we're going to be a church that prays publicly and out loud. We are not ashamed of the gospel. But I pray we are also a church that humbly prays God's will, prays God's kingdom, prays God's forgiveness for ourselves and others. Because I pray we are a church that is transformed from the inside out. Amen.
Indeed, our daily bread is a gift from God, as is the bread that gives us life eternal, that which sustains us, that which makes us okay with God. It is that gift that we remember every time we gather around this table celebrating how Jesus, on the night when he was to be betrayed, took bread. Said, this is not ordinary bread anymore. This is my body, broken for you. Take and eat in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood poured out for the forgiveness of your sins. Take, drink in remembrance of me. Sisters and brothers, as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim his life, death, and resurrection until he comes again. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we approach this communion table in humility and with the realization that we participate as members of a fellowship. Let your spirit dwell in us as we eat of this broken loaf in remembrance of the life of your only begotten Son. As we taste of this cup, may our hearts glow with the warmth of your love. Help us to turn from this table, determined to fulfill the purpose of your love in our daily lives. In Jesus' name we pray as he taught us, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. This is not a Disciples of Christ table. This is not First Christian Church's table, and it is not my table. This is the Lord's table. As such, all are welcome here. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Giving is a way of opening ourselves to opportunity to give freely.
let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, accept our tithes and offerings as a gift of worship to you. Multiply what we give for the effective growth of your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We come to this table and we are sent forth from this table into the world to point the way back home. We do that out there offering our invitations in conversations and in relationships, but we model that right here. If the Spirit is moving in anyone's life, calling them to make either a confession of faith or to join with this worshiping body, First Christian Church Kerrville, the table's always open, but especially during the hymn of invitation. Before you go, we have a sad goodbye to say today. Miss Norma, you don't have to come all the way up. Miss Norma, Lance's mother, Karen's mother in law, God, rest, God bless you, <laughs> is, moving back to, or is moving to Houston to be closer to family. And so we are sad to say goodbye. She has been a cherished member of our congregation for a good while. And we just, she is actually here for both services every Sunday. She's what we call a repeat offender. And she brightens my Sunday every Sunday. So we send her forth with our blessing and with our love. So everybody, make sure you give Miss Norma a hug on your way out. Well, friends, before you go in peace, receive this benediction. As you go, may you serve and pray in ways that serve as evidence of God's transforming power in your lives. Go in peace. Amen. Amen.